Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and today I want to chat with you guys a little bit about something that people don't even think about when it comes to uh, training and those of us who use some of these training methods. And what a lot of people don't seem to grasp is that dynamic effort work is so good at hypertrophy that if you carefully select the variations you do for your dynamic effort lower body day, you can build actually really big legs just off the dynamic effort work. And when I say big legs, I'm talking hips, quads, hamstrings, everything, right? Even, even glutes to some extent. You can build all of these things off of the dynamic effort work. Uh, and I'm not saying there's no benefit to other work because I obviously do other stuff, but they will build much, much larger legs than a lot of people realize. And in fact, uh, you can build a pretty impressive squat and deadlift uh, using these as the base. And so what do I mean by carefully selecting? Well, well, number one, obviously doing stuff like sumo pulls. Because when you look at all the data we have on sumo pulls, we know that it hits the legs a bit harder than the conventional does. Right? Particularly things like your quads. All of your quads, your hips. Right? It hits all those things really hard. And when you look at dynamic work, we're doing very, very large volumes of quality training. Right, speed work has a very high stimulus to fatigue ratio. It gets around a lot of the axial loading problems that we have. And I'm not saying there isn't some axial loading with it, particularly when we get to bands and chains and stuff. There is, but it's much lower. It's much lower per unit of fatigue. And the sumo deadlift itself, we can handle higher volumes of training. We can handle much higher volumes of training. So when we start doing it for speed work with compensatory acceleration, it by itself has potential to, to build your lower body to a much larger extent than most hip hinges and deadlifts do. When done in this fashion, when done in our, our three-week pendulum wave of speed work, and even when done raw, but in an ideal world, you'd have bands and chains, works very effectively. Does so with less shear on the low back. And it's still going to have relatively low axial loading relative to the stimulus we're getting. All right. And we start looking at the, the box squats with it. Again, particularly when we start going on a deep box. I'm not talking about a high box. If you're squatting onto an 18-inch bench and you're above par parallel, that's not the same. But watch me on an 11-inch box. Watch where my hips go. Okay. We're three inches below parallel using that wide stance on the box. Okay, what do we know about wide stance squatting, first of all? Well, we know that it works the quads just as hard, and when I say we, I'm talking everyone who's looked at the research on it. That is a myth that wider stance squatting works the quads less. It uses more hip and glute, right? It uses more hip and glute. It doesn't mean it uses the quad less. The amount of knee bend involved determines how much quad you use. Well, how do we get more knee bend with a deeper box? The deeper your box is, the more quad, and particularly the more lower quad you work. Just like on a squat. The deeper your squat, the more your low quad gets activated. Okay, well, we're, we're going below parallel. But we are able to use a very wide stance on the box squat, which means more other muscles involved. Okay. More other muscles involved. And again, particularly when we go deep. And when we go deep, what happens? We use more quad. And we use more glute. And we are forced to use a lighter weight for a higher amount of muscle activation. Well, if we're forced to use a lighter weight, what does that mean? Less fatigue. Come back over and think of those stimulus to fatigues going on here. And when we look at the movement patterns, is there any muscle in the lower body that's been neglected? All right, because that wide stance, the way that we do it, we use more hamstring too. Watch, watch the way that you come up off that box when you sit way back on the box, the hamstrings get involved. We use a tremendous amount of quad, tremendous amount of hamstring, hips, glutes, right? Abductors and adductors. 
you know, I defined all that. Calves, everything. All right. So all these muscles get heavily worked. But then we come over to the programming itself of speed work. It's using compensatory acceleration. When we come over and again, we talk about the effective rep theory. Because again, we can talk about theory all we want, and then we can go look in the real world and look at the guys who use these training methods next. Because you know, a lot of people will say, oh, I don't care about science, I want to see results. Well, better look at how many ultra jacked and strong guys use this training approach. But let's hop back over to the theory. Effective rep theory. When weights are moving slowly the last five reps before failure where you get your training effect, the wrench that gets thrown in that is speed. And we've seen experts point that out that, hey, I mean, that's only true with slow reps. When we start moving the weight fast, reps way far away from failure start to hit upper threshold fibers. Well, with speed work, let's say on average, you know, you're, you're doing 10 doubles and 10 singles on this. So let's say you're doing 10 doubles on the, the speed box, just using this as an example, and 10 singles on the speed pulls, because we can argue about singles versus doubles on the speed pulls all day long. It's 30 effective reps for your entire low body. That's the equivalent of taking six sets to failure if we use the effective rep theory or getting within one rep of failure, right? Six sets. Well, when's the last time any anyone who's looked at any research on muscle growth has ever found that six sets on big multi-joint exercises to failure, six sets to failure, didn't cause very large amounts of hypertrophy, if not the maximum hypertrophy in the studies compared to other groups. We can maximize growth off that. Okay. It's giving a similar number of effective reps. While again, using big multi-joint movements, you're using a ton of muscles. And we haven't even discussed upper back or any of that yet, especially if you mess with like a safety bar and then the sumo poles and bands and chains. That's its own beef. I'm just talking about legs. Limit this one to lower body. All right. Well, we know on the squat size equals strength. Plenty of studies have proven that. How many guys, how many guys who use this approach, squat and deadlift elite level numbers, how many guys have broken world records in powerlifting who use these approaches? All right, quite a few. How many of them have pretty jacked lower bodies? Pretty common. Pretty common. I'd like to think I have reasonably jacked legs. For a 220 pound guy. All right? I got reasonably jack legs. That's what I do. Not the only thing I do. This can be your foundation. You know, obviously, we people who do this, we have a max effort day also and another supplemental work on that day. But again, normally we would want to hit every muscle twice a week. So, so what if we're doing other supplemental lifts? On our max effort days, we're still doing this as a day of training. And I would suggest that even for those of us who do this, that this contributes to most of our leg gains. Now, I'm not saying the supplemental work, particularly that we do on max days, aren't isn't helping because it does. But where's the real bulk of it coming from? It's coming from this. So if a person really wanted to do, to focus on leg hypertrophy and being functional and athletic at the same time. Wouldn't this training style be the way to go? I think it would. All right, speed work can cause maximum leg growth. Absolutely can. The theory behind all the hypertrophy and effective reps and what we know matches it. It works. Plenty of top-level athletes and lifters utilize it and have utilized it for decades. It, it, this, this works. I would say this works way better than even people who are like, well, I'm going to do a 5x5 five five for my squats and stuff, and that's fine for a novice. A lot of novices aren't set up to do this. They don't know how to do this. They get hurt. If you're not a novice lifter anymore, this is what I would suggest you should be doing. It will work phenomenally well. 
All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.